Welcome to Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm Sam Dunning, a digital marketing, sales, and business growth evangelist. Tune in and subscribe today as I'll be interviewing business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. You'll be learning their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. Welcome back to the show. I'm delighted to have joining me today, Del Dupree. Dell is more commonly known as the Copier Warrior and is the appointed leader and founder of the Sales Rebellion. Dell has been a full-time sales professional for over 13 years. Uh, Dell actually provides sales training and development at his company, the Sales Rebellion, who challenges the status quo. Uh, Dell was named as one of the real faces of sales in LinkedIn back in 2019. Uh, Dell is very audacious with his outreach and he's driven to create a community of sales professionals that cause undeniable curiosity and true impact in the way they walk and prospect with their clients. Um, he's on a journey to teach the masses how to choose legendary in their sales career. Dale, how are you doing, man? Thanks for joining us. <laughs> I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on, Sam. I appreciate you. No worries, man. So there's a heck of a lot of things we want to cover today, including Word. your top sales and business growth strategies, um, how digital marketing's helped you along the way so far. But first and foremost, Myself and the audience, Dale, would love to know your story, your background, where you grew up and how you got into the business world, man. So it'd be great to hear it. Yeah, happy to tell it. So my story starts back in 1984, which is a year before I was born. It was the year that my father founded his copier firm, Connectivity Business Systems, CBS for short. So I was born a year later with toner running through my blood, basically. And now my dad had been in copiers before uh, that time as well, too. So he started back in the 70s. And his brother was actually in copiers as well, too. So it's almost like a family inheritance that we had of selling copy machines. But even though I grew up in the business at 17 years old, I got signed to a record label and I toured in a band all over the United States. Um, oh, wow. Okay. There's a record label as well, too, after starting with an indie band. Um, you know, and, and doing that for about five years full time. And then for probably about three or four more passively kind of part time, kind of whenever I felt like doing it kind of thing. But I was born and raised in Orlando, Florida. A lot of people don't even know what that means. Most people just come here to visit or come here to die, which is a joke that we usually make. <laughs> um, and, and Orlando is not home of, as we call it, the rat. Uh, you probably call him Mickey Mouse, um, but we're actually 30 minutes north of that area where we thr we're a thriving community. We have a lot of culture around food, around uh, beer, which is probably what most people are listening right now. Are, I love are a good beer. Yeah, sounds good to me, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not you know tourism the way that, that most people spell it out. Uh, and it, it, it was a very successful place for me to build my career in sales from the, the B2B perspective. Uh, a very thriving economy. Very small town, uh, but but you know we have over a million people living here. I think we have like 1.5 million people living in Central Florida and Orlando right now. So so you know, with that said, you know my dad was like the mayor of of this part of the world as well too. And so over time, as I got into the concept of selling, I realized that what my dad was wasn't a really good salesperson. He was a really good relationship builder. He was okay. decent at creating community around the things that were important to others while also getting a little bit of his agenda in there as well too in in a very non-intrinsic way it was he wasn't doing it to be manipulative or to for self-glory or, or gratification by any means he lived a very humble life within his means he always made sure that we had everything that we wanted and and that we felt as if we were taken care of, even if he was living paycheck to paycheck. So that's my humble beginnings. Where I am today is Sales Rebellion. I, I run and own and operate uh, this organization. We're a sales training firm. Um, that's about it. Oh, and I'm a dad. I like to say that now since it's awesome, only been man. I like to put that in there. How, how old's your kid? <laughs> He's two years old. Oh, congrats, dude. We've got a baby on the way, actually, late May this uh, year. So awesome, excited dude. Congratulations. For that. Yeah, Thank you, man. Exciting. That'll be our first. So Awesome. So you Going back to near the start, Dale, you said you were you're in a band of some sort. So were you doing that yeah. while selling or was that your your first bit of business? Or tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, I, I, I started selling for my dad technically around the same time. And it was a summer gig, basically. I It was right before I headed out on my first tour with my band. I was in my senior year of high school. 
my dad said, hey, do you want to try something a little bit more adult at the office, which I thought was pretty funny. But where before I had, I had done things, you know, for the company, but mostly under the supervision of somebody else in most cases where this, you know, sales people in general are typically wild animals just thrown out into the streets to do whatever they want. So my dad basically said, you have a car, you have a license, hit the streets, here's some business cards, go sell some copiers. So I, I actually sold some copiers that summer and then went on tour about four months later, three months later. Ah, so, uh, got it. So you did this in the yeah. summer and then you, you went back to your band. What kind of music were you doing, by the way? It was, it was heavy metal. Oh, cool, man. Okay, so proper rock stuff. Cool. All right, <laughs> so you did this as a summer gig. And was that your first taste of sales there, Dale? Yeah, I would say so. It was, it was my first taste of sales and it was okay. You know, I, I was the prodigal son kind of thing. You know, it was happening at least at that point in my life where... Cool. Right. My dad was my best friend at that point in that stage of my life. And so I, I had worked for him that summer. I made like three or $4,000 too selling over the course of 90 days. So I knew I was good at it. And, but when I came home, I actually, I was a barista at a coffee shop for like six oh, okay. months, eight months. That so, so, and then after that, I was a painter, commercial painter. And yep. then I was doing landscaping and I was doing all that stuff over the summer, basically like to fully understand my story. You know, it's, it's good to, to know to understand that I, I didn't have this perfect relationship with my dad. You know, he definitely pursued it, but I, I pushed against it and thought, I don't want to end up in the family business kind of thing. So the next summer I was doing landscaping and the next summer I was painting with some. Ah, I see. I was going to say, I thought this was all in one yeah. summer. I was like, you jam packed nah. a lot in that summer, man. So I was not, I was an entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Cool, man. So, okay, so you tried various jobs. And what, what lessons would you say you learned in terms of business, in terms of sales, when you're working for your dad's company? Yeah, like, well, what I'll say is that with any kind of work that I was doing at that point in my life, my dad had taught me hard work ethic. And so leading up to that, you know, just going out there during the summers as a kid, or, you know, or spring break or winter break for school, you know, when I was, and I was homeschooled, by the way, all four of me and my siblings were all homeschooled by my mother. She's a saint. And okay. When we had those breaks, we would spend time at the office. And so my, my upbringing was based around this concept of not like always being busy, but always doing something productive and always working toward this end goal and end result. And so you know, what I learned with my dad was that through the course of my life. And so even though I wasn't working for him every summer when I was home from touring, I desired to work hard. I desired to level up inside of my economic standard. So even if the band had made some money on that particular tour, when we got signed to Warner Brothers, you know, we and think when we were on much better tours and doing well, I still worked when I came home, just being honest. And, and honest, I, really, I did it because I just wanted to hustle. That's where my mindset was at that point in my walk. Got it. Okay. So you had quite an entrepreneurial spirit by the sounds of it, Dale. <laughs> Word. That's a good cool. way to sum up. Okay. Awesome. So... All right, so you did that for the summer. Then you had a few few other jobs, it sounds like, in terms of kind of gardening and working at coffee shops. Is there any anything else that you were doing down before you started your own biz? Yeah. I, so when I was when I went full time with my dad, it was two thousand and seven. Okay. Um, and so it was right in the summer. It was right at during the economic collapse. So I I with what's going on right now, I actually have experienced a similarity to what we're experiencing now from an economic standpoint. But, you know, nobody had money. You know, nobody knew what was going to happen tomorrow. It was pretty wild times. And so I, I weathered that storm 2007, 2008 with my father. And in the following year, in 2009, when we thought that things were going to start getting better, that was when we had an epidemic, which was a pandemic of the swine flu, H1N1, which was basically oh, no. the Spanish flu reinvented, you know. So yeah, I remember that. A million people diagnosed. But I remember going door to door and having signs up, you know, like, don't come in here. Um, you know, and this was 10 years ago, 11 years ago. So there was no remote work. It wasn't, that wasn't possible. And if it was, you know, there were, were people doing it and innovating that way, but it was like few and far between bro. So it, it was very difficult for, for a lot of us. And, and so for four years, <laughs> three years, I was literally raised in side of pandemics inside of my sales walk with my dad. And, so about that time, about 2010, 2011, we actually started to rise pretty powerfully. But, but in the process of doing so, I can remember those three years of 
just kind of wondering what's going to happen of checking out of the office at five o'clock and going to work further with somebody so, else yeah, quarterbacking or working weddings. I was just hustling. That does sound tough. So how were you guys still marketing yourselves and how were you still generating sales in, in those times when it was really tough in terms of the environment around you? Yeah, truly, we were just focused on other people and what they were going through. And we, we weren't calling people and saying, hey, can we sell you something as much as we were calling people and just asking them, what's the update? How are y'all? Here's where we are. Here's what we're doing to innovate. Here's the things that we found that are working. Here's some differences that we've seen in the economy as far as the way that we're approaching it and getting feedback from others. And we built a community, a very strong one. And, we, and by the time we got out of the problem itself, you know, so not that we, we weren't thriving during that time at all. You know, but when we got out of it, we, we saw the, the ramifications of our actions, which were very positive. And we saw massive growth for the company within two years, 2010 and 2011, from where we were at, which was like paycheck to paycheck every Friday, dude. So, so really, we just we put the community first. When people couldn't pay their bills, we weren't saying, well, we'll come pick up your copier. We were saying, well, what can we do to help? How well, can we you with any of that can we help you with referrals can we help you with your business strategy can we give you ideas can we sit in fellowship you know what what can we do to help and and for the most part we just listened and a lot of people have a hard time asking for help and so a lot of times just sitting and listening is the best way to get to the core of what somebody needs in the first place so we became avid listeners which took my sales career to the next level really like that really like that and i think that's something that hits home quite a lot right now, Dell, especially with the coronavirus pandemic that's going around and the fact that almost all of us have to work remotely. Is, are you having to work remote right now, Dell? Yeah, but I, yeah. I, we were a company founded on remote work. The only time we're on site is if somebody picks that package, which, yes, we've seen a nasty uh, little dip in what we would be billing out over the next couple of months, but that's okay. It, you know, honestly, it really truly is. If we can, we can go and do this stuff at another time. And, and we believe that we'll get through this as a community if we continue to act like one in the first place. And so not, not being upset or even, you know, calling the people back that have canceled or booked, you know, on sites and saying like, well, how about September, <laughs> you know, just meeting people where they're at and in this moment and going alongside of folks. But we've actually, the last two weeks, we've seen a massive increase in our business from people that are now working at home and, and are struggling. And they, they, so they need to be connected to a sales trainer or sales coach. And they're, they're looking to double down on this part of their, their walk. So we've seen an uptick in business over the, the last couple of weeks because of it. Definitely. And likewise, I'm feeling fortunate that I'm in a digital marketing business. So we're, we're lucky enough to be able to work from home and still still a business. So we're in, we're in an okay spot on that front. And I really love the going back to what you said earlier, I really love the fact that when people are in times of crisis, opening up a conversation really, and rather trying to hard sell them, just talking about how you can overcome the problems and suggesting alternatives mm -hmm. and really talking it through. So that's a great piece of advice for anyone in sales, anyone in business or marketing that's listening in or tuning in. Awesome. Okay, so you're working for your dad's co. What happened once things started to get better? What was the next stages that happened, Dale? Yeah, we spent a couple of years just crushing it. You know, I, I, I remember writing 77 net new accounts one year, you know, which is cool. probably my record. Um, although it was the same year that we got acquired. And so I didn't count up until the end of the year. I just counted up to August. And I, so I probably was in the 90s um, for net new. But in our industry, you know, the, the average, the most I've ever seen somebody write is in the 30s. Um, just from my coaching and like traveling around the world. Uh, but, but the average is in, is in like the 13 or 14 range, net new accounts. Okay. Per year. So, uh, so my average was 60 and, and, and I had a lot of fun doing that. And I developed it at that stage in the game for myself over the next couple of years. So we, we took the company to another level and my dad actually had the option to sell uh, to a local business that would, benefit my career more than it did him and that's that's just the man my father was like I said earlier he was a he's a, a kingdom builder that was who my dad was and so he he took some some money not a whole lot of money to be honest with you but enough for him to you know kind of have a little bit of a, uh, a cushion and then he kept working <laughs> he, he worked for the company that he sold to he got into a sales role and and continued to work right alongside me and support me and for me my career elevated to the, the next level I I think my last year with my dad, I made somewhere in the 50,000 range 
um, you know, as we continued to struggle to get out of debt. And, and we, we became debt free, by the way, before the story ended, you know, before we sold, we were completely debt free. It, it was freaking great, dude. But, but I went the following year, I made $150,000. And after that, I never looked back. I just kept making more and more and more year over year. And I saw the potential to do that from the very beginning. In 2012, when my dad sold the business based on the comp plan, based on the activities that I needed to do in order to get there. And so I ran with it. I went all in. I invested into myself. But, but more importantly, I did what my father did. And I started to invest back into my community as well, too. And awesome, 13 no, years, dude, I did that. So it was a lot of that's fun. That's a great story. And that's, that's really awesome that you got to work with your father. So that's, that's yeah. always nice working with family. I'm, I can kind of relate because I work in quite a small, close-knit team and I work with my cousin. He actually is one of the co-founders of, of WebChoice where we're at. And so I've been working with him for years and years and it's really nice to be able to work with close friends and family and um, have, that, have that kind of cool environment. Cool. So just before the company got acquired, you said you had one of your record years and you basically set a record and copy yourself, it sounds like. So how did you do that, yeah. Dale? For anyone listening, is there any golden nuggets that you could say, look, these, these are the steps I followed. I appreciate you hustled, you put the work in, but what does that mean in layman terms? So what did you actually yeah. do to make it happen? Everybody's got their own sauce, you know, and everybody has their own recipe as well, too, for that sauce. And, and to me, it's not, there's never a secret to it. You know, everybody's sauce is a little bit different some's hotter than others like i like to think of mine as like fire sauce but but really like I, I would say that the formula that i used was something we teach at the rebellion which is my reason theory which is to radically educate and share one's narrative um, okay but but the focus on it is the concept of taking the pitch to the next level you know most pitches are 30 seconds or less they're very product centric some of them will focus on a little bit of pain maybe that somebody's feeling but for the most part, they're boring, they're dull, and they're stale. And that's just the way that the sales world works, and it always has. And so I decided to start incorporating storytelling and first touch pieces into my outreach. So I had what I call the chest of wonder, um, which ties back into a nostalgic place for me in my childhood. But before we go down that rabbit hole, the <laughs> idea was that I created a, a synergistic approach from between sales and marketing for myself. And so okay. I believe marketing and sales – are one and I used it that way where I, because I was in such good understanding of the marketing I was using and why I was using it because I made it as a salesperson, I believe that it worked a lot more effectively for me as a salesperson as well too. So whether it was a, a, a card, a business card, or it was a QR code people were scanning, or it was a six foot cardboard cut out of myself, or it was an empty donut box. There's a million different things that I curated over the process of this but the most important was the letter campaign. I actually created the letter campaign back in 2010 is when I got the idea for it. And it was during our pandemic when we couldn't knock on doors. And so I was sending letters in the mail, but there's five of them in total that I created because I created a cadence around it. Because as you know, in, in marketing, one of the most important things is not to just throw something out there and hope that it sticks. It's the idea of the follow-up and the repetition and, and that cadence concept. So I, sure. exactly that. And that would have been my secret sauce essentially for hitting that record year. But I extended that record year for the next seven years of my walk because I, even though I never quite hit the 70 or the 90 range, again, on that new business, I wrote 60 plus on average. And I had reps that wrote just as much as well too when I became a VP of sales. So I transcended that concept of, uh, or transferred that concept of, hey, I'm a good rep and I can make good reps too. So I found my leadership skills as well along the road. Awesome. You know? So it sounds like you're mixing marketing, sales, outreach, all under one roof really, Dale. And yes, sir. you found your own way to kind of prospect these potential customers, reach out to them and then sell to them, which is awesome. Um, because that's what I believe any sales professional who works for any business should be doing or any sole trader or any business owner should be doing their own marketing whether that means social selling, whether that means offline marketing, whatever it actually means, whether it's digital marketing, and then working that into a sale and putting it through the funnel to close the new business. Awesome. So what were you doing, Dale? Were you sending personalized letters? Because it, it sounds like you're doing all sorts of different types of personal outreach to get in front of these decision makers. Yeah, I do believe in the personalization product and concept, but I also understand that if you have 300 people on a list, and you need to get in touch with all of them within the short span of time, you know, let's just say a week to, to four weeks. It's pretty difficult for you to write 
Sally and Tracy and David and Mark on every single letter or to shoot videos doing the same thing, even if you're just writing it on something that you're holding, it's difficult. And so I created this methodology of causing familiarity to, for the prospect and using the psychology behind sales more than the tactics and the tricks. And so okay. really creating a human connection essentially. So for example, with the letter campaign, some were crumbled up, some were burnt, some had coffee stains on them, <laughs> some, some had passport stamps all over them as that they'd traveled around the world. The idea was is that I put so much effort and energy into the product itself and created a very familiar feeling for the person reading it in regards to either how busy their life was or how much they hate sales calls. Uh, or how much they hate marketing that shows up at their office, right? So whether whatever it was, however I was connecting, I was creating a connection between me and the person reading it. And because of that, it created familiarity, which caused them to feel as if I made it for them. And and it wasn't, I wasn't trying to do any kind of smoke and mirrors concepts here or to manipulate people to think that I was creating something personalized. If people asked, I straight up told them like, yeah, I send that to everybody. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was extremely transparent about the process as well too. But again, the concept of what I had created, people wanted it because they, they what happened it was that I transcended the concept of the sale. I wasn't in competition anymore. I wasn't even competing to sell something in the first place. What was happening is that this person was saying, you're an expert at sales and about 90% of the, the business world has a problem with sales, right? They're always looking to get better and to sell more and to do more. And because sure. of that, I've created relationships with, with individual leaders. Awesome. Awesome. And do you think the reason why it worked so well was because it was different because people weren't used to receiving these kind of things and they were, would they call you up and be like, Dale, this is, this is strange, man. What is this? But I like it and start a conversation from there. Or I would think that different is a good ingredient and a good statement to make in, in regards to the sauce itself. But I think more than anything, what it was is that we were interrupting their typical patterns. So it, didn't, okay. it wasn't really so much that it was different, or, or, but that was a piece of the puzzle. Creativity was a piece of the puzzle, but really what it was is that they were so tired of the monotonous sales calls, the boring interactions that they were having with salespeople, we spiced it up. We were like their sales mistress, basically, in those <laughs> moments. And, and it, it, without all the, uh, the ethics and the morals <laughs> being <complicated. laughs> Right. So we were, we were giving people honesty and truth and also getting, giving them a little bit of temptation to leave the craft that they were dealing with. And most sale, most people that, that are creating or buying a commodity product, like a copy machine, you know, they're not truly loyal to the company or the salesperson at the end of the day, because they, those, those people, the company and the salesperson have treated the product like a commodity to begin with. And so that transference of emotion is already there. And all you got to do is step in and say, Oh, hey, I'm over here behind this big, bright red door instead of that dark, bleak, you know, white, pale door that you're looking at or walking into currently. So if you want to join me, feel free. Awesome. So it sounds like you really worked out a way to disrupt the market and, and stand out. Awesome. Okay, fantastic. So, Dale, after, the, after your dad's company got acquired, what, were the, what happened next for you? So I spent seven years with the following, with the firm that bought us the following seven years, I became okay. their sales over time. Um, I was their number one rep, commercial right. rep from the, the moment that I got on board to the moment that I left. I was a selling sales manager even at one point. Uh, so I ran a team, I ran a territory, a very large territory and, and kind of took everything that I had built and, and put a team in place at different checkpoints around what I had, you know, created my kingdom and started to basically give back to the next generation that was coming into the office. Uh, unfortunately, my father passed in 2016. Oh, and sorry to him. I appreciate that. And then he died of cancer. And in the process, I became disconnected with my organization. There, there are a lot of things I could say about that. Um, there's a lot of drama that I could bring up as well, too. But I, I choose to transcend those things. And so the bottom line was is that I wasn't happy anymore. And that I loved the people that I worked with and that I was very scared and sad to leave in the first place, but that I knew that I needed to. So the following year in 2017, about halfway through the year, I resigned and I ended up going to work for 
a larger organization that was worth about two billion dollars called Xerox, um, and I, I represent okay. a local firm for them in the Orlando area. Um, and I spent about a year and a half, basically redefining their sales program and process in the Orlando area. Um, but then my leadership that I had was sacked, and new leadership came in, and and that started to just untangle and unwind very quickly as well too and it you know there was all kinds there's all kinds of things i could say about that as well but yeah no worries man pushed out of the company (laughs) so and not not anybody trying to make me leave but yeah just was a different experience right and so i spent a year and a half there breaking records of my own over at that company as well too and then i i realized in the process and actually somebody reached out to me on linkedin and said what about the rest of us and so i realized in the process of what I had been doing and the, the, the culture I was creating, the reputation I was building that people were looking to me for sales advice and that I didn't just have to sit here in these territories with these 10 or five different people that I was managing at these different organizations, but that I could, I could help hundreds, I could help thousands, I could potentially help millions. And that's the path that we're on right now as, as a rebellion is that we wanna see a million people worldwide light their torch and rebel. Awesome. Okay. So just before we get into your current business, during your, your few years, at, what was the company where you said you were vice, was it vice president of sales deals for seven years? Yeah, that was, that was called North American Office Solutions. Okay. So North American Office Solutions. Um, what, what lessons did you learn? Because it sounds like you were leading quite a big team, Dale, in, in various areas. So there must have been a few mm-hmm. gold nuggets that you can share with us in terms of management, in terms oh, yeah. of how you looked after everyone, how you make sure everyone was hitting their quota, what marketing strategies you were using, if you were still using your technique to reach out to decision makers or any other, any other information you could share with us that could help our audience learn on how to market and sell better. Yeah, you know, I, I played the game at that organization internally. I, I had to, to survive. And I, I don't suggest that people play any kind of game inside of their organization, but that they transcend it. And I, I worked toward that through over time, but for the most part, you know, there were still closed door meetings and there were still opinions that were shared privately and not publicly, uh, which, you know, turn into gossip and turn into problems. And so I, I learned how to deal with different departments inside of the organization. I learned how to, to better align myself with the service techs and not the service department itself, right? Where a lot of people look at a department and they disconnect from the people in, in the process. And so instead of saying, oh, that goes to billing, I would remember the names of the people that worked inside of there. And I was very, very, very intentional with the relationships that I built internally as well too. If I was in the area and I had 10 minutes, I would stop into the office then I would go around the office and either drop off a little note saying thanks for another great month or some candy or, you know, whatever it was that I was doing specifically. To yeah, have nice touch. Nice touch. People internally. Yeah. So okay. building relationships internally is a huge piece of the puzzle when it comes to your growth. But when it comes to, to going from a top producer to a manager, uh, VP of sales, the thing is, is that not everybody is cut out for that transition. So you need to recognize that in yourself. Like the problem is, is that at a certain point, a sales rep cannot be promoted any further. And, and so they might want some kind of leadership role or they might want some kind of cut in ownership. But the, the harsh truth that a lot of sales reps that are listening right now even need to come to a realization on is that you can't go any further. And especially if you really truly suck at leadership, but you think you're good. You have to sit back and recognize those types of things. I was led by a man that was the number one sales rep for his company and the number one sales rep, you know, goes and starts his own business and he became the CEO. Right. And so I realized, and and even looking at that, that my father, you know, he took a a step back out of sales altogether because he knew that somebody else was going to lead a sales team better than him. At the end of the day, he was just a really good salesperson. Right. So, so even seeing in that example of my father and, what sometimes we have to lay down, right? It, it's a harsh reality for some because maybe you've been selling somewhere for 20 years and you're still waiting for that promotion, right? It's never going to come because there's no way, you know, there is no top. <laughs> Even as a leader, <laughs> there's no top because once you're a sales leader, if your teams aren't performing, it all falls on you. It doesn't matter if those people That's suck. It. It's your fault for picking them in the first place and not being able to get them to be better than what they're doing. So I learned real quickly that, I had to lay down what I wanted and I had to focus on what my reps desired. I had to nurture that. I had to become the most 
important person in their life when it came to, to the way that they looked at their career. And so I, I befriended their families. Um, I involved myself very deep. And, and with most of those reps, I still have an extremely good relationship with them. And, and I, I credit that all back to my dad and the way that he treated me and the way that he led his communities and the way that he led our company. But other, outside of that, I probably wouldn't have known what I was doing, to be quite frank with you. So I didn't, I didn't you know, teach my guys to do exactly what Dale did. I just took my formulas and I molded them around their own walks. I love that. I love that. And I love that you take, took the personal approach. And it sounds like, like you said, you got involved with them, you got involved with their family. So some of the best sales leaders that I've worked with in my time, they've kind of really understood why I wanted to hit certain targets. And they said, look, why do you want to do this? And I, as, a, as, a, as a younger sales rep, I just be like, yeah, I just want to make money, really. And they're like, no, why do you really want to do this? It's like, well, I want to get a mortgage. I want to support my fiance. I want to do X, Y, Z. And once you get to the root of it, what as to their why and why they want to be selling money, um, why they want to be hitting quota, then it, it helps so much. So that's, that's some really good points there. Okay, awesome. So moving forward, um, let's, let's get to the, to the present day and well, near to the present day as to you setting up the Coffee of Warrior. What was the driving force behind this, Dale? And when was the light bulb moment where you thought, I'm going to set up my own biz and go it alone? Yeah, actually, so the, the Copier Warrior was, he was developed way back in 2010, 2011. Ah, okay, sorry, the sales were rallying, my apologies. Yes. However, he is a huge piece to the puzzle of how I got to the sales rebellion, which was the concept of helping other sales reps become personally branded, to become very aware of themselves, very aware of others, very, looking at more of the personal development side of their sales walk and not just how, you know, or which, I should say, tactic or topic that they were using in order to become better sellers. So whether it was the challenger sale or spin or it was Sandler, you know, whatever it was that a particular seller was using in order to better themselves. I, what I realized what made a really good salesperson was the ones that knew thyself that had that principle in mind. And, and so the copyright warrior was kind of born from the ashes of 2007, 2008, 2009, um, you know, and, and it was the rebirth of connectivity business systems. And we, we put him to, to rest. Like we, we buried him like we made a big tomb and we put him in there and we floated him out into the ocean in 2019 when we started the sales rebellion but he's a huge piece of the puzzle of why the sales rebellion exists he is the founder of the living pipeline he is the the authentic mind behind the reason theory my rebel roots concept um, our sales wanderer theory as well too or even our rebel invasion, which is essentially invasion is our acronym for how to run a sales cycle. It's a great name too. On top of it just makes me think of aliens, but, <laughs> uh, but so the, the big picture being that when we started the company, it was all based on my past experience and what made me successful as a rep and not again, not to go and teach other people how to, to do, you know, do these things one through 13, exactly as I say, and you'll be successful, but to take the principles behind what, what made me good, because everybody has their own personality type, their own attributes that are key to what their success will look like. And so we, we tapped into that piece and formed the rebellion. Fantastic, man. Okay. So what year did you set up the business? In 2019, we're, we're okay, one, so last year. 23 days old right now. So fantastic. Okay, excellent. And how was it to start with, Dale? Was it, was it tough starting out on your own? How, how did it go in terms of kind of setting it up? Did you have customers ready to go or did you build it all up from scratch? It'd be great to learn a bit more how you actually grew the business, what marketing strategies sure. you used. Yeah, I had a crazy following on LinkedIn. Um, Got it. Which I still do today and it's, it's even bigger now. But at the time, the following was what kind of fueled my fire and made me excited about starting my own business and helped me to realize just how quickly I could get do, to doing something and to become successful. It, it was my LinkedIn network that it was, were writing me messages and encouraging me, people I'd never met in my life, you know, to stop selling copiers and to go do something else. And, and really what something else was, was teach other people about these principles in which you speak around sales. So... I started writing those things down. Well, what are my principles? I started looking at my habits. What are my habits? I started really digesting and, and understanding and analyzing my system. And, and that was where a lot of our growth came from, was understanding our own system that we wanted to put together and put in front of people. 
also understanding the brand that we wanted to, to develop. So if you've seen the Sales Rebellion brand, you've realized that it has this very 80s vibe to it uh, with a modern twist, but which is me, it's my foundation. I mean, I'm an 80s child and I grew up, you know, as a kid in arcades and malls, you know, and so as, so for me, it was, it was really connecting my brand to who I was so that people would buy into it, not just because it's the company, but because it's an emotion that I'm transferring to people when they look at it, when they feel it, when they read it, when they see it, when they touch it, everything. So the growth piece, just for everybody listening, that's wondering, paid ads, are, were, you're the cold call king. So were you just on the phones? 99.9% .9 of our business year to date has come in through LinkedIn as an inbound lead. And wow. uh, which is a pretty wild thought, but, but uh, we, we have utilized some other, uh, types of, or mediums, I should say, around digital marketing and, and B2B selling. So cold calling phones, walk-ins. We've utilized some concepts in order to do some outreach, but we have not used that outreach to a capacity of closing deals. So we've only, we've actually used the outreach side as awareness now. So like, let's just say, for oh, okay. example, in Dallas doing a public talk, what I would do is I would target four or five different businesses and I could see who follows me in those businesses on my LinkedIn. And then I would just go and I'd say, Hey, could you tell so-and-so I'm here and this is my name. And, and what I would do is I'd tell my name and then I'd say, Oh, and, and let them know it's, you know, it's the copier warrior. That's how they'll probably know me. Cause that's how a lot of people knew me through LinkedIn. Right. And so you'd have someone come down the stairs, like, what are you doing here? Right. Like, it's so nice to meet you. And you'd have this relationship <laughs> built that was already created through social media that, that us as people, we tend to kind of forget about, we forget about what social is and at its full capacity and what it can do from a relationship perspective. So imagine, you know, going to these strange places that I'd never been before as a professional, as a musician, I'd been there, but as a professional B2B salesperson and, and meeting and greeting people that were telling me about their families and taking me around their office and introducing me to Stan, the, the accounting guy. I mean, it was, it was a crazy, crazy, crazy time, but we only used it for an outreach um, or for an awareness concept, nothing else. You know, the, the, other, the other side of the business being that everything that was coming in through LinkedIn was converting to a sale. So we didn't need to be going out and cold calling people and bothering them. Instead, we were just educating people. But what's that that's led to is it's led to a bigger following or people reaching out and saying, hey, so-and-so told me you're awesome and that, I, and that I should hire you for sales training, right? Things like that, so. Awesome, Dale. Okay, so LinkedIn's been a huge tool for your business growth by the sounds of it, especially, well, if it's done 99.9% .9 of your inbound and your sales, then that's, that's going to be the one, that's going to be the channel you recommend, I guess. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So how did you do that, Dale? Did, did you build up a personal brand? Were you putting out regular content? What were you doing exactly that made you so big on LinkedIn and grew your following yeah. to, to the scale that it is now? It is the long game. LinkedIn is the long game. And so people that are, that are weak minded when it comes to time, they, they will not enjoy the LinkedIn game unless, unless you're paying for ads and, and you're you know, dumping thousands of dollars a month into that type of output. I believe that those things will be successful for individuals as well too. But I mean, I've probably put like $100 into paid ads on LinkedIn just to test it to see like if it actually did anything. And, and because my organic reach is so good and my growth has been so consistent, it just didn't matter. There was no point in continuing to do it um, just based on the reach itself, you know, I, I get an average of 30,000 um, unique looks on each individual post and I post five days a week. And, and that's just the average, you know, you'll have a post that gets 100, 200, 300, 400,000 impressions on it every now and then as well too, which elevates and escalates the entire process for you. But it's the consistency that's created for from years, two years of, of posting every day, except for the weekends on LinkedIn that has gotten me to that point. You know, so if you're running a business and you're trying to elevate and you're already successful and you're trying to elevate it to something else, my recommendation is to get on LinkedIn and start blogging. Some people can do what I've done in the course of, you know, nine to 10 months, right? I've seen that happen as well too, but you, know, you got to remember when I tell my story, two things that are important. Number one is that I never added somebody on LinkedIn. So my, my growth is so organic to all the way down to that T. So my following is, is so heavy and, so, and it, it shows up for me because it's literally 
my following. It's not anybody that I forced to be friends with me or asked to be friends with me or pushed a friend request out to randomly, right? Got it. But the second piece of the puzzle is the, the concept of the community that you're building inside of LinkedIn as well. And so where a lot of my success has come from is not even my own posts. It's come from getting into influencers pages uh, with them in the minute or the 10, the first 10 minutes of them posting something and being the first comment, second comment, third comment that's on their page. And not just saying, this is a really good thought, but putting my opinion out there, picking a very hard stance as well too in my walk and not to try to polarize people uh, or groups or to try and, turn people off to my message, but to let people know that if they don't like it, that I'm not for them. Right. And if they do like it, that I'm their tribe and, and that I'm looking for them as well too. And, and because of those couple of different concepts that I took to the marketplace, I had, a, I've had this massive and sustainable growth where it's easy for an influencer to be born overnight, to use a couple of the different tricks in the algorithm to send sure. requests and, and build up a following, but it's not an authentic growth if you're not allowing people to come to you and to want to consume your content in the first place. So there's, there's a strategy here, but that's, it's that's not a brilliant, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I like it and I like everyone who tunes into the show knows I harp on about LinkedIn and most episodes. And I'm always saying you need to take advantage of the organic growth, especially when only about 1% of LinkedIn's community are actually putting out content. So now's the time to really grab hold of the, the uh, organic reach that's available, like you well said, Dale. But I do like the fact that you said you're a little bit controversial in terms of what you're posting. And I think it is important to be unique on LinkedIn because so many, so many people put out just the same old marketing spill that no one really cares about. Um, and you do have to give your own personal touch, which Agreed. I found over time has really helped me in terms of getting more organic leads. But like you say, you need to be consistent. So you do need to post daily and you need to engage on other posts to get the views to your profile that ultimately result in the DMs that are going to give you leads. So awesome. Then did you say, so you said you did a little bit in terms of events, Dale, but that was more for brand awareness more than to actually get sales opportunities. Have you used any other digital marketing like website or search and optimization or paid ads or anything like that or email marketing? Yeah, we, it's pretty organic and you know, like you can Google Dale Dupree right now and it's pretty crazy what happens. And I think a lot of people pay tons of money from a PR perspective to be able to do what I've done naturally, just based on creating a following and putting myself out there. And you know, like the first like five things that show up, like the first like 40 odd searches are me, results are me. So I've got the first couple pages, but the first couple of things that show up is my LinkedIn, my old copierwarrior.com site, my sales rebellion site, my YouTube channel, and then a ton of guest podcasts. So I, I believe that when, when people are out looking for, for me as their reality, they find it, right? Where even if they type in the sales rebellion, our website organically just gets a ton of hits on a, on a monthly basis you know, compared to what it, it should be getting, which is basically nothing because we're not doing any advertising for it. Our SEO, what we've done is we just on the back end, everything that we put in there was analytically charged. So in all the little talk tracks you see, there's not really a lot of sales pitching as much as there's just words that need to be keywords <laughs> inside of search optimization concepts, right? So the content side of things. Okay. It's heavy on content. So cool, man. All right. So LinkedIn has been a huge part. And as we said, we recommend anyone listening who's not yet active on that should certainly get active on that platform. So, all right, Dale, moving forwards. If anyone listening is thinking of starting up a business or anyone's just started a business themselves, have you got any pieces of advice to help them be a success? Yeah, I would tell people that are starting a business not to quit. And, and that's a, it's probably a popular thing for a lot of folks to say. But so what I would add to that is to embrace the suck. That to understand that when things suck is actually when they're at their best because they're challenging you to become a better person, not just for yourself, but for your family, for your community, for the people that you're trying to serve in the first place. To remember that sales isn't something that just sparks and, and turns into a million dollars overnight. And, and so your business is going to struggle at some point. And it, it, whether it's in the beginning or it's 10 years down the road, right? Because we both know that with some startups, you get started because somebody says, I got a million dollar contract I want to give somebody, right? And you, you're the guy that goes in and bids on it, wins it and takes it, right? But that's not your destiny. That's just one deal, you know? And so being very mindful and cognizant of 
the fact that things are going to, to be inconsistent over time is extremely important, but to fall in love with that process and to, to be present inside of it and to embrace it instead of trying to run away from it. Got it. Got it. Awesome. Okay. Fantastic. And are there any particular habits, Dale, that you recommend? Is there, have you got any daily habits to help yourself be a success or that you recommend anyone follows that you've found have, have done the trick for you in terms of when yeah, you know, I, it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I, I'm one of those guys that ended up, you know, paying for a couple courses in, in my younger days. And, and, and I know a lot of people and speak to a lot of people as well that just say, oh yeah, I dropped 300 bucks here and a thousand bucks there to figure out how to sleep better. Right. Like, because that'll make me more successful. And, and, and I'm being super sarcastic for a reason, because a lot of the people that are out there saying, these are the habits I do to be successful they are their habits and not yours. And so I think what's most important for people to understand that about my success, my routines, my habits is that I embrace them and that I don't, they're not somebody else's, they're mine. Sometimes there are concepts inside of those things that are absolutely driven by people that are smarter than me and that are more successful than me. But for the most part, the things that I do, I've created in my own way and throughout my own existence and over time. So that's what I would tell people not to, to try and force what somebody else is telling you to do every morning at 6 a.m. You, you mean so we don't need to get up at 4.30 a.m. down and go to the gym? <laughs> well, I am part of the, I was part of the 4.30 a.m. club. I'm more part okay. of the 5 club these days. Uh, there we but, go. but it's different for me. Like I, I, that's a peaceful time for me, dude. Because that makes from, sense. From 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., I'm nonstop with people. And I'm, I'm, I am an extrovert, and so I feed off of that energy, and I don't mind it at all, and I love it. But there is a sacredness to time alone. It is the most important hour for most of us. And it's that time of reconnection. It's that spiritual walk. It's that look at how much bigger life really truly is. And these things are extremely important, especially for people that are ambitious about their success. Do not look at success as dollar bills. Success is much bigger. It is a culture and it, it is something that you have to nurture in your own walk as you go. Really like that. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Dale. Okay. Amen. So it's, it's been great. We've learned your story. We've learned how you've grown your own business. We've learned how digital marketing and LinkedIn's played a huge part in your growth so far. So Dale, something I like to la ask everyone on the show is if you could thank just one person for having a positive impact on your career so far in your business, who would that be and why? Mm. Yeah, it'd probably be a, at this point just kind of a cop out to thank my dad because he's in everything I do. He's the foundation of this whole entire organization. So I'll take this opportunity to thank my mentor, Rich Johnson, um, because I don't get to say his name enough in my walk. But I will tell you that this is a man that that led me into the fiery gates of hell and then up to the most glorious golden gates of heaven, you know, that he stood right beside me throughout all of my problems throughout all the things that were going on in my life. And he took my, he didn't take my father's role. I should say, I should clarify that real quickly, but he, he, he became like a father figure to me in the process of us selling the business and him becoming my boss instead of having my dad as my boss. But he did it in, in a very altruistic way as a leader, something that I'll never take for granted. And that I'll always, when people ask, how should I lead my reps? I'll, I'll, I always think of him first when I go to, transferring that knowledge to somebody else. So, and I'll also tell you this, just so that it's, it's recorded and that people can understand how amazing this man is, is that when I got my promotion to VP of sales, it was his job that I took. It was intense. He stepped right. out, out of his chair and gave me his position. He actually, it was his idea. He went to the owners of the company and said, you should give Dale my position because he'll do better. Than, than myself. And when I was told that by my leaders, yeah, I was floored. I get a little choked up even right now thinking about it. But those are the types of men and women in our lives that truly care about our outcomes, that, that will have that molding effect on us as leaders ourselves. And, and it's important that we remember them and speak them as often as possible because they are the reason that we are where we are today like that Del. and would you say it's important for anyone in business to have their own mentor just like you have that's helped you along the way yes <laughs> <laughs> in a word I, yes i still i still have mentors even though i'm a coach now i i still have mentors that coach me so yes absolutely it's extremely important 
Fantastic. Del, appreciate it. So everyone, you've been listening or tuning in or watching Sam's Business Growth Show, where we interview business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from across the globe. We learn their story, how digital marketing has helped along the way, and their exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. The show is sponsored by webchoiceuk.com, helping businesses grow with results-driven digital marketing, SEO, and conversion-focused websites and mobile apps. So Del, Thanks so much. Let us know, just before we wrap this up, how people can connect with you. Tell us a quick snapshot of your business and how people can get in touch. Yeah, so salesrebellion.com is a great place to start. You can go to linkedin.com backslash IN backslash copier warrior to find daily content. You can also find my podcast, Selling Local, out there on the internet somewhere. You can also just Google Dale Dupree and pretty much find anything and everything that has to do with me. Amazing. Dale, thanks very much for coming on. Appreciate you, bro. Subscribe today for more digital marketing, sales, and business growth tips from the experts.